Hello and uh, welcome to the Middle East Report. In this program today we will be discussing what is the uh, modern miracle, which is the State of Israel, as we celebrate uh, Yom Hatzmut, as Israel uh, approaches her 61st 65th birthday. We'll be discussing some of the most amazing achievements that uh, Israel's achieved in a short period of history, including facing uh, five major wars for her survival, in which Israel's come out on top. And Israel now is currently uh, leading the way in terms of science and technology, and it's an incredible blessing to the world. So we'll be asking, what does the future hold for Israel, and what are the challenges facing Israel in the years to come? I'm joined today by uh, Keith Fraser, who's a spokesperson for the Zionist Federation, and uh, Jeffrey Smith, from uh, f former director of Christian Friends of Israel. Um, Jeffrey, I really want to um, start off by talking to you, because you have really been a pioneer, haven't you, in terms of really outreach to reaching out to the uh, Jewish community and, and being a pioneer, and really what's come of that relationship has blossomed for the uh, Christian community and their relationship with the Jewish community. Well, that's really been the Lord's favour in putting me in those in those places. But I, I w well remember one earlier, Yom Hatzmut, 25 years ago, Israel's 40th anniversary. I was at St. Mark's Church in Kennington in those days, and I think we were the only church in London that celebrated Israel's independence, 40 years of it. And um, the police were concerned in case there might be a terrorist attack. So they, there was a van load of police at the back of the church. But um, when people were coming in, one of our um, rather wayward parishioners arrived with two, can two bags of drink. And, um, and, when, and he was a bit drunk. And when they tried to stop him, he drew a knife. And um, so the stewards called for me to come down. And, um, and Danny uh, hit me with a haymaker of a punch, landed me flat out, and, and he and I had to go to the uh, Horse Free Road Magistrates Court. So I, was, um, I suffered from Israel's 40th anniversary. But, um, you know, it's been a tremendous privilege to be a witness to the miracle that, that God has done to this extraordinary thing. And Israel's restoration as a state uh, 65 years ago is one of the, is the most remarkable prophetic confirmation of the scriptures in our lifetime. It's something that the prophets long to see. It's something that we in our lifetime have had the privilege of seeing. It's an amazing thing and to see uh, what Israel has done for the world in blessing in these 65 years. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and, and Jeffrey, um, can we start, how did your journey start? I mean, how did the Lord really put a great love for Israel and the Jewish people on your heart? Because you've been an incredible ambassador and a spokesman on behalf of the Jewish community for Israel. And, uh, you know, you're held in such high esteem by so many leaders in the Jewish community. Well, um, it, it, it does for me actually go right back to that time when I was in the leadership team at, at St. Mark's. And um, my wife restarted a group praying for Israel there. And that night, um, a young man, um, we got home. We, we took one of these intercessors back home to Pimlico. Then we went home. And it was about midnight. There was a, a ring on the doorbell. And my wife went to the door. And this young man um, put his foot in the door and, and said, call Jeffrey. I was doing the washing up. And um, my wife called me, and, um, and then he pulled, drew a butcher's knife out of his coat, and he put the, ch the knife in my chest with one hand, and he held my wife by the throat with the other hand. And, um, and he, he asked me to give him the keys of the, of the church safe. But I'd done the banking, and the church safe was empty. It was a, uh, it, it, and um, he said, well, you know, swear in the name of Jesus that you, that you won't report me to the police. So I, I said, well, you know, you've got no right to be here, and I'll decide what I do when you've gone. And um, he, he, he pushed the knife a bit. And anyway, um, the, uh, in the end, um, he, he threatened that uh, if we did call the police, he would... Um, he had friends on the outside, and if he went to prison, we would be dead within a week. But um, 
uh, he we did uh, he did go he he pushed us inside he fled and um and we did call the police he he did go to prison but he did threaten us again after that and we would have been really fearful of him but um then i was invited to go to israel to take a post in israel and um i knew that i should go and this was 2 years after he had threatened us in our home and um i it was a tough decision it was a time when there was uh, there were conflicts going on in the middle east but i said yes i i wrote the letter to say yes and i got it ready to post and then there was a phone call and it was this same young man from 2 years back and he was ringing to say that he had given his heart to the lord jesus on the top deck of a bus in brixton high street now to me that says something that he that the very day the night that prayer for israel began at our church he attacked us in our home with a knife and the very day 2 years later when i said yes to going to to jerusalem his life was turned round and i believe there's a special place god has for jerusalem and i do believe that miracles happen because of that absolutely absolutely and my other guest is uh, keith fraser from the zionist federation uh, this is going to be quite an easy interview to compare to what you used to particularly being on press tea with uh, ken livingstone but uh, keith can you describe to uh, our, our viewers how you became involved in israel advocacy how did i become an israel advocacy well um i guess i'm quite an outspoken sort of person and i've always uh, been an advocate for israel i'm jewish i feel that um the jewish people need a strong israel israel needs a strong diaspora and i believe it's my duty to carry the torch carry the flames and do my bit for israel the idf in israel who protect the country militarily um i've got the hardest job we've got a different type of job and it's important that we rebut the lies and rebut the um the nonsense that's being spread about israel and the jewish people and i feel that is my duty to to do that excellent and and today you're representing the uh, zionist federation uh, which is an incredible organization that uh, is really at the forefront of uh, defending israel and promoting israel absolutely the zionist federation is the leading um pro israel organization in the uk it is the one organization that's been going before the state of israel it's been going since 1899 and in fact was part of the um the balfour declaration balfour wrote to the zionist federation of great britain to talk about the fact and express the fact that there was going to be a state of israel for the jewish people in um british mandate palestine and the zionist zionist federation has carried on in its role as the preeminent pro israel organization is involved in a number of number of things whether that be organizing events whether that be um lobbying for uh for the state of israel in parliament whether that be rebutting some of the lies in the media it's at the forefront of of everything that is to do with zionism and israel in the uk excellent and uh, we got a clip to go to now that uh, looks at some of the excellent work being carried out by the uh, zionist federation I think the IOC have done is to bow to seeming pressure from Arab nations because it was Israeli athletes that were murdered. I don't recognize Israel and I don't believe with Israel. Who's sick that they this dirty little murderous nuclear armed apartheid state? There is a large campaign of delegitimization of boycott divestment sanctions laid against Israel unfairly there's clearly a significant gap between the public image and the reality of Israel the reality is really our greatest asset and the challenge for us is to expose people to the reality of Israel and that's one of the things that the Zionist Federation is committed to doing we 
We work in Parliament, we work in the media, we work across cultural, academic and scientific platforms. The ZF decided to start running Science Days because we know how much Israel has to offer in terms of innovation and science and technology. And we never hear these good stories in the British media. We decided that we would start making these stories happen ourselves. She's famous for completing the London Marathon in 17 days in a bionic suit. And now Claire Lomas is meeting the man who made it all possible. I was wondering how come uh, the wheelchair is the only solution for paralyzed people. And then there was a the help from the Israeli government. I could calculate and design the device. And this is how it was created. It's amazing you know, the confidence it gives you to be your own height again. A lot of people are quite surprised when you say, they say, where's the suit from? America, and you know it's from Israel. I have very little idea about Israeli technology until today. It was, um, it was very inspirational. Now we see how it's like in other countries and the technology they make and stuff. I was really, really surprised to see what kind of new innovations Israeli technology is coming. It's really good. It's helping humanity. very important for us to take speakers, Israeli films, cultural events onto campuses which we know are hotbeds of anti-Israel hostility. And what we try to do is paint a fair picture of Israel in these environments. The ZF is deeply committed to partnering with other organizations both within the Jewish community and outside the community. The lobby of parliament for example could not be conducted if we did not have such a deep partnership with Christian Friends of Israel who have activists all over the United Kingdom. Nobody works harder than the ZF to reach out and support Israel through grassroots advocacy. We offer these people training and encouragement to go out and get Israel's message across and these same people are the ones who come out and demonstrate and stand up for Israel where no one else will. Let's go now to Sophie Keith Blodrat, Fraser, he's a spokesman with from the Zionist, Zionist Federation. Any justification to target civilians is immoral and is illegal. We are gathering, together with thousands of people joining us by webcast, to remember the darkest moment in Olympic history. I congratulate the Zionist Federation for bringing together groups of people to say, we want a one minute silence. With growing hostility towards Israel, we at the ZF campaign tirelessly for Israel to get fair treatment in parliament and in the media. We need your support to allow us to continue to do this vital work. Welcome back to the uh, Middle East Report. Um, uh, Jeffrey, uh, you're representing here uh, Christian Friends of Israel, CFI, and I know that they, you've had very, very strong uh, working relationship with the Zionist Federation. How did, how did that develop and how is it blossoming? Well, I think it really uh, began um, after uh, I came back from Israel, um, from living for three years uh, in Jerusalem with my wife, we came back and um, there was a lady, an intercessor in Barry St. Edmunds, a, a wonderful lady who had been really uh, concerned for six or seven years uh, about the history of Barry St. Edmunds and the fact that back in the 1230s, um, the, uh, the Jewish community there had really been robbed and massacred and driven out. Um, it was an appalling uh, history. And um, a a the more she prayed about it, the more she felt that unless something was done to say sorry, to express repentance, then there was no real hope for the church to make advance, that the church owed this to the Jewish people. And as I looked into the history, I, I too came to share this, this opinion and a, and a burning sense of the injustice of what had happened, that the Jews had lent 
to the, uh, the to the abbey the money to do the building and then um, the abbot had preached a viciously anti-semitic sermon on uh, Good Friday and then they had pursued the Jewish people fleeing and lynched some in the street others had fled and then they'd banned them from ever coming back to Bury St Edmunds and actually what happened there had happened in a number of other towns and I was invited up to Bury to speak about this and um, when the church there caught the vision um, of one extraordinary evening she said to me um, this intercessor she said Jeffrey what's happened here I believe will go across the country and will reach the Queen now I didn't really believe that was uh, that seemed to me uh, far-fetched and quite impossible but in the following years that actually did happen and all the towns where the Jews have been persecuted in England there were services of repentance and this reached Parliament and a, a petition by 10,000 signed by 10,000 Christians um, asking the Queen to reverse to the uh, the the reg rule that had been passed in the Privy Council in 1290 for the expulsion of the Jews. And um, when this was going to happen in Parliament, I, I, I went along to Alan Aziz, who was then the uh, executive, chief executive of the ZF. And um, he didn't believe, rather like me, he hadn't believed it was, it, it was possible, but it did happen. And there was that um, a ceremony in the Moses Room where the Christians expressed their deep sorrow and sent a message to the Queen. And that was one of the messages that really lay behind the beginning of Holocaust Memorial Day, by Jack, which Jack Straw put through the Parliament just after in the new millennium. Um, so uh, that really, I think the Jewish community understood that there were Christians who, who loved who loved the God of Israel and loved Israel today as an expression uh, of that realization of the of the what the prophets had prophesied would happen that what happened in 1948 with the restoration of the state of Israel was an extraordinary fulfillment of the prophetic scriptures Isaiah and, and the others Absolutely. And um, Keith, how important is it? I mean, when, when we're looking at um, today, 2013, um, sadly, we're, we are witnessing uh, uh, an increase in anti-Semitism. Uh, it's even worse on the continent than it is here. We're seeing uh, a rise of so many malicious anti-Israel organizations and uh, part of the uh, whole program to delegitimize the state of Israel and the Jewish people. And we've also seen uh, false and misleading media reports in our mainstream media coverage it comes to, to Israel. But how important is it that there is this strong evangelical support for, um, for Israel and the Jewish people here in Britain? Well, uh, um, obviously, Israel is the birthplace of Christianity. And so, also, you have to consider that, that Israel is the only country in that region that allows Christians the opportunity to pray freely. It allows Christians the opportunity for their holy sites to be kept in good order. And I'm sure you probably realize, and I'm sure your, your viewers may or may not know, that prior to uh, 1967, when, when Jerusalem was under Jordanian control, there was a lot of desecration of holy sites, Christian, Jewish, etc. So Israel is a very important place, not only for Jews, but it's very important for Christians. And I, th I believe that Christians world, worldwide realize, and they go to Israel because they know that they are going to be welcomed, their holy sites are, are respected, the religion is respected, and, and Israel is a, is a home for the Christian people as well as the Jewish people. So Israel is very, very important to all religions. And sadly, what gets mi misrepresented is or done, not even reported in uh, elements of the media, elements of the, of the Arab world, is that Israel is the only country in the Middle East which, which allows the growth of Christianity. I believe there's now 10% of the population, or 10%, I should say, of the Arab population in Israel are Christian. It's about 150,000 Christians in Israel. That's grown in the last 10, 20 years. So it's a thriving place for Christianity. It's a very, very important place for Christianity. So, of course, it's, it's very, very important 
that it continues to have very strong relations with, with, with Christianity and Christians worldwide. Excellent. And um, Keith, also, uh, you know, we're here to talk about uh, Israel's amazing achievements in 65 years of a short history. Uh, but we also got to remember when the state of Israel was born on the 15th of May 1948. It came after probably the darkest chapter in Jewish history in which uh, six million precious Jewish lives were murdered at the hands of the Nazis. And then we saw the rebirth of the state of Israel in 1948. What is it like, um, what does it mean to you as a Jewish person to know that there is a homeland for the Jewish people? It's interesting because I've been lucky enough uh, in my lifetime to know that there's always been a refuge in uh, the state of Israel for, as a Jew. I can't imagine what it would have been like before that because I would have felt effectively a gypsy if there was any persecution here. Where would one go? I always say to people, if you're a child who's left home, you get a mortgage, whatever, let's say the bank decides to foreclose on, the, on your mortgage, where would you go? You would go home to mum and dad or to your, your guardians. Um, where would a Jew go if this country said, sorry, you've got to leave or it became untenable to be here? Well, of course, the only place that we know for sure that would welcome us is Israel. So when you ask how important is Israel to me, did you ask that? Yes, for, to me yes. <laughs> for me, it allows me to stand up as a human being to know that I'm safe. I'm safe here, and I have a tremendous amount of uh, respect and love for my country of birth, which is, which is Britain, England. But I also know, and I can feel confident to know, that if anything would happen, I also have my parents or family over there who would always welcome me in open arms in times of trouble. Excellent. And uh, we have a clip to go to now, and uh, this looks at the uh, historical birth of Israel. And just prior to that, in uh, 15th of May 1948, in which Israel's first uh, foreign minister, Abu Ban, is uh, talking about how he came to uh, be in Israel. The first arrival in the land of Israel was in a very strange context. It began, as most stories did, in the Second World War with Winston Churchill. The plan was that uh, the British Army, or the British intelligence, would arm and finance and support the Haganah, in which hundreds of young Israelis would be taught how to blow up railways, how to destroy bridges, uh, how to assassinate the German leaders. But if there was to be cooperation between the Haganah and the British, who was to be the link between them well, here was a British officer named the Major Eban who could command equal confidence uh, from the Zionist leadership and fidelity, of course, to his uh, uh, duty as a British officer. I therefore left Cairo on a train from Cairo to Kantara to Rehovot. I entered the land of Israel in a rhapsodical mood. When I came to Rehovot and I smelled the orange blossoms and I saw the Hebrew writing of Rehovot on the signpost, I knew that I had entered Hebrew country for the first time. Jewish underground resistance, the Kalmar, had already been trained and financed by the British government, which in all other domains was an adversary of the Zionist movement, and hundreds, perhaps thousands of young Jews would be trained in guerrilla warfare. This Israeli generation belonged to a different world than that of their fathers. Their image of themselves was as clear as the summer sun and just as uncomplicated. From the beginning, the Jews of Palestine longed to fight the Nazis under their own flag. The Jews saw the Nazis as their most hated enemies. While the Arabs generally supported the Nazis. 
allegiance of the Arab nationalist and religious leader Haj Amin al husseini of Jerusalem became blatant, there was a certain logic to it. Anwar Sadat explains. It was very simple for us. Germany is the enemy of our enemy. England. So the enemy of our enemy is our friend. In July 1942, soon after the Battle of Tobruk, the German tide in North Africa was reversed by the Battle of El Alamein. Without this British victory, the gas chambers and death camps would have sealed the fate of Palestine's Jews. The Battle of El Alamein lasted 12 days. The British had lost 13,500 men, but the Germans were in full retreat. The German dream of conquering Africa and thus opening the gate to the Middle East had been smashed. General Montgomery had crushed Hitler's armies. Welcome back to the Middle East Report. As you can see in that clip, uh, the, those were the key events that occurred uh, during World War II that uh, led later on to the establishment of the State of Israel on the 15th of May, 1948. Um, Jeffrey, what I really want to bring you in, I mean, as a Christian, what is the significance and uh, the meaning behind the re-establishment of the State of Israel after 2,000 years of the Jewish people in exile after 2,000 years? Well, to, to, to grasp that, you need to go right back. And um, you think uh, Justin Martyr, now, he was born in Shechem in about 100 AD, and um, he was born to pagan parents. Um, and when he was about 30, he saw the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. And um, he be actually became a Christian, um, but he seeing the, the destruction of Jerusalem he interpreted that to mean that God had finished with the Jews um, and uh, the Romans got rid of Jerusalem and they established what they called Aeolia Capitolina. They wanted to get wipe the name of Jerusalem off the face of the earth. And uh, what Justin Martyr deduced was that God had finished with the Jews and now uh, he was doing something new with the, this Christian church. And really that idea took root from the first century and, and, and carried through for hundreds of years. Then in the 16th century, Christians began to re rediscover the Hebrew texts of the scriptures and saw the promise that one day God would regather the Jewish people from exile and re-establish the, the nation of Israel. And right from the, the 16th century, there were those in the church who were looking forward to that time that would come when, uh, when God would sovereignly regather Israel from north and south, from east and west, as the prophet Isaiah had promised, as the Psalms promised, and reestablish his people in, in Israel. And they waited. <laughs> and, it, I, you know, that is the significance. I remember um, uh, some years ago, I was speaking at a church in Wales, and there was this lady there who said um, she remembered about the time of the First World War, and she was a little child of about five in this Welsh church in Cardiff. And there was this visiting preacher, and uh, she, she spoke up because I'd speak, uh, spoken on the text from Isaiah 43, verse 5 and 6, about God regathering from the north and south and east and west, and saying there were Jews from a hundred different nations who were regathered into this state of Israel. And she said, I'm so glad you've come to tell me, because when I was five, um, this preacher leant over the pulpit, and he was preaching from that same text, and he said, little girl, the time will come when God will regather Israel and restore the state. It won't happen in my lifetime, he said, but it will happen in yours. And she was a five-year-old girl then. She was in her 80s when I met her, 
And she said, I'm so glad God brought you to Wales to tell us this has happened. And you see, that, that is the significance of it, that something for which, uh, the Christ, which we've waited 2,000 years has happened, that Israel has been restored, reestablished as the prophet said it would be. And, um, and it was a sovereign act of God to do it against all odds. And it's been, um, uh, you know, a, a blessing to the world as a, as a result. Absolutely. Uh, and, and Keith, uh, when the uh, Jewish state was established on the uh, 15th of May, uh, 1948, um, the very next day when, is, when Israel declared independence, she was attacked by five uh, Arab neighbors. No one gave Israel any chance of surviving, and yet Israel survived five major wars in her history uh, and continues to be um, a source of uh, light and inspiration to what is becoming a very dark and dangerous Middle East. Um, uh, I just My question to you really is how significant is the fact that Israel has survived 65 years in a very, very hostile neighborhood such as the Middle East? I think it's all part of the, of the overall miracle of the state of Israel, the modern day state of Israel, to be in an area where you are surrounded on your doorstep with very hostile neighbors wanting to completely eradicate you. Uh, and it survived against all the odds. It's unbelievable. A betting shop, for example, wouldn't give you, wouldn't give you any odds going back to 1948 of Israel surviving. But here we are 65 years later and it's going strong. And so it gives you hope for the future, what it's managed to achieve, what it's managed to overcome, to accomplish in the, in the, in the face of real struggle and um, threat from its neighbors and the world. It does give you hope for the future because it's still on the doorstep of some very unstable, hostile neighbors who are vociferously anti-Semitic, anti-Western, and it's still surviving. It gives you hope, and it is a miracle. And so what does that say to me? It just says to me, it is a miracle. Miracles can happen, have shown to happen, just through the, 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 um, the victories of the IDF in those wars and hopefully going forward as it seeks and its quest for peace. I mean, uh, looking back at uh, Israeli history, it is quite fascinating because the more you actually look at Israeli history, the deeper and deeper you go. And, and some of the amazing highlights for me uh, coming from a historical uh, historian background is the fact of uh, A was the uh, War of Independence in which Israel faced uh, five Arab armies with virtually no weapons. Uh, the Six Day War, which was a miracle in which Israel almost tripled in her size, including having Jerusalem back under Israeli sovereignty. Um, the uh, Entebbe Raid of 1976, in which Israel rescued so many Israeli and Jewish hostages in Uganda. Um, and then um, Operation um, Solomon, in which uh, Israel rescued or actually brought back the entire uh, Jewish population in Ethiopia to Israel in uh, a matter of a couple of days. Um, looking back at some of uh, Israel's achievements, what have been some of the highlights over the last 65 years that uh, you remember vividly? I, I don't believe we've got, got all day to film this program. <laughs> so um, you know, there, there are numerous. It's military victories. It's military capability. Everyone says, oh, well, it's got America helping. In fact, Israel helps America develop some of its weaponry. The F-16s have been modified by, by the Israelis. And improved. America goes to Israel for a number of, number of uh, inventions, whether it, be, whether it would be military, whether it would be medical, whether it would be IT. Uh, have we got all day to talk about them? I mean, of course, I'm going to be very supportive, and any outsider looking at this program would say, oh, well, you would say that. Well, okay, maybe I would say that, but the truth is, look down the list. Everyday things from the mobile phone. The mobile phone was, uh, I think, invented in Israel. Motorola, the originator of the first mobile phone, I believe, was invented in Israel. Instant messenger, the USB port, just general things every day that we use uh, were developed in Israel. Microsoft have an enormous research and development facilities in Israel. Google, every, even Apple now, I believe, uh, have a, a big... Uh, uh, they, they have a big representation in Israel. Israel has the second biggest IT industry in the world after Silicon Valley. Uh, it, it's, it's incredible. The list of successes are amazing. I'm not just saying that because I am pro-Israel, because I'm pro-Jewish. All the people who want to boycott Israel, all the people who want to, who want to uh, 
say, I don't want anything to do with that country. Well, they better stop using mobile phones. They better stop using their computers. They better stop using certain medical innovations because if you want to boycott Israel, then you're going to have to boycott a number of things you use on a daily, in your daily life. You're asking me what are my, the things that stand out for me? There's too many to tell, too many to say, I should say. Um, all I can say is that come April, when it's 65 years, we should celebrate Israel's existence, but we should also celebrate its enormous successes, which are endless in a 65-year history of overwhelming difficulty and hostility. Uh, uh, and Jeffrey, what have been some of your highlights in um, Israel's uh, short but an incredible uh, 65 years of existence or re since the re-establishment of the State of Israel? Well, there are many, but I'm, uh, one sticks out in my mind. Two or three years ago, 2010, I think it was, I met Yoel Margalit. Now, he was uh, a teenager. He was 15 in 1948, and he came to Jerusalem in 48. He actually was born in, in Serbia in 1933, and when the Nazis overran Serbia, uh, the Jews were rounded up in his community, and they were taken in six trains. He was, uh, the first five trains went straight to Auschwitz, and all the people on them were killed, exterminated. He was on the sixth train, and for some reason, that got held up here and there, and he went to two, he was in two concentration camps, Bergen-Belsen and Theresienstadt. He was the only child from his community to survive the Holocaust. He came to Israel 15 years old in 1948. Um, he'd missed some education, so he went to night school to make up his education, but he went to work in the zoo, in Jerusalem Zoo, to earn money for his keep to support him. And when he was called up, the army, I'm, I'm amazed at the army, given the, the, the difficulties of those times, they said the best thing he could do for, was to go uh, to the Hebrew University and study mosquitoes. And, um, you know, there are thousands of different varieties of mosquitoes in the world, but there are 30 different varieties in Israel. Um, by the time he was 20, he could tell those 30 different varieties apart without using a microscope. He became an expert in mosquitoes at a time when mosquitoes were causing enormous ravages right through the world. And um, uh, he... he uh, became known actually as Mr. Mosquito because what happened, he was one day going down um, a dried up riverbed in the Negev when he came across lots of bodies of dead mosquitoes. He took them back to his laboratory and he found it was a bacillus that had, um, that had killed them. Uh, he called it BTI for short, it's Bacillus Thuringensis Israelensis. It could have been named after him, but he named it after Israel, BTI. And he took that bacillus and he took it to the Yangtze River Basin, he took it to West Africa, he took it to Latin America, and because of him, millions of people who would otherwise have died lived because they were saved from malaria, they were saved from river blindness because of the work of that one man, the one man who was the only child from his community to survive the Holocaust, and because of his life, millions of others have lived. You know, I, I mean, there are staggering achievements. Um, but I, there was one I saw in the in the ZF clip. I saw this little, I, it's a tiny little pill. But I, I, I mean, that is an amazing uh, achievement. Um, the uh, uh, I, I, I don't know if you know how it originated, but I, but it shows the the heart of Israel for peace, and. Um, it began with a, the Popeye missile, 18 feet long. <laughs> and um, uh, when it was being demonstrated, a gastroenterologist uh, said, look, if you could miniaturize that, it would, be, it would be very helpful. And they said, well, maybe we could. And they reduced it from 18 feet into this little pill. Now, the point of the Popeye missile was that it's got a camera in the nose, and as it travel, as it traverses the territory, it, it, it relays back to the controller 
the pictures of, of the terrain it's crossing. And this little pill, if you swallow it and you have a, a pack here, it, it uh, relays to the pack here the pictures of your gut all the way down. Wow. And then the next day, the surgeon can take it and without having to do anything invasive, he can see the whole of your, of, of your intestine and find out where there's, where there's been any problem. That is Israeli ingenuity. And that is turning the, uh, the plow, uh, turning the swords into plowshares, turning a missile into a medical invention like that. That's amazing. And uh, we've got a clip to go to now that's entitled um, Israel Against All Odds. And it shows you some of the most amazing achievements achieved by the state of Israel um, in her 65 years of existence. One of the smallest countries on earth, with one one thousandth of the world's population, only 60 years old, under constant threat, and yet, relative to its population, Israel is the largest immigrant absorbing nation on earth. It has absorbed 350% of its population in 60 years. Israel is the only country in history to have revived an unspoken language. Since the founding of the state, Israel has more Nobel Prizes per capita than any other country. It has more laureates in real numbers than China, Mexico, and Spain. Israel has the eighth longest life expectancy, 80.7 years, longer than the UK, US, and Germany. Israeli films were nominated three years in a row for the Academy Awards Best Foreign Film. Israel is the only country that entered the 21st century with a net gain in its number of trees, even more remarkable, in an area that's mainly desert. Over 90% of Israeli homes use solar energy for hot water, the highest percentage in the world. Israel's scientific research institutions are ranked third in the world. Israel is ranked second in space sciences. Israel produces more scientific papers per capita than any other nation by a large margin. Israel has the third highest rate of entrepreneurship among women in the world. Israel has attracted the most venture capital investment per capita in the world, 30 times more than Europe. Israel leads the world in patents for medical equipment. Israel has more NASDAQ listed companies than any country besides the US more than all of Europe, India, China, and Japan combined. In proportion to its population, Israel has the largest number of startup companies in the world. In absolute numbers, Israel has more startups than any country other than the US. Israel is the only country whose indigenous population returned to its native land after 2,000 years of forced exile. There are 26 official Muslim states in the world and 18 official Christian states, but there is only one Jewish state. Welcome back to the uh, Middle East Report. Uh, Keith, I'm so pleased we showed that clip. It just shows you what an incredible achievement uh, the state of Israel has achieved, which is uh, sadly not seen on so much of our mainstream uh, media. Now, we know the Zionist Federation is um, celebrating uh, Yom Hatzmut, which is Israel's uh, 65 years of independence. Can you explain uh, what's, what's going on with this celebration? On Is it April the 12th, isn't it? Tuesday, um, April the 12th. The actual date has escaped me. Oh, so you, yes, the 16th, <laughs> sorry, Tuesday the 16th of April. Right, okay. Well, it's going to be the biggest celebration of Israel's birthday that this country's ever seen, I think Europe's ever seen, at uh, Wembley, Wembley Arena, I believe. And uh, it will encompass a number of Israeli acts, a number of, shall we say, uh, well, I would say neutral acts that uh, anyone could enjoy. People like uh, Alexandra Burke from The X Factor. Uh, there's a dance group who's been on Britain's Got Talent. So it's not just Israeli artists or Jewish artists, but it is to celebrate and be proud 
to celebrate Israel's 65th uh, milestone birthday uh, for Jew, for Christian, for whoever wants to join in and celebrate Israel's birthday, its achievements. And, what, and as we've seen by the clip, a number of its uh, uh, you know, amazing innovations. It's a celebration of the country, of what it stands for, and what it's supposed to stand for, which is a light upon our nations. Absolutely. And uh, this is a note from the Zionist Federation. They're actually giving away um, four uh, free tickets as part of a family, uh, family deal. And you can enter into a prize draw if you email uh, office at zfuk.org, uh, which is up on your screen now, uh, with the title Revelation in the subject box. And you'll be entered into a free prize draw to actually win some tickets so it's definitely worth doing um, and, and Jeffrey I know that you've been very much part of these uh, Yom Hudson celebrations organized by the Z Z Zionist Federation and they, they're an incredible um, spectacle to behold and uh, are you are you invited to this one? There, there will be a number of people from, from Christian Friends of Israel going to it, as we have done year after year. And it's, it's a great thing to partner with our Jewish friends and express our solidarity with them and our support for them as they celebrate uh, together uh, Israel's birthday. Excellent. And uh, we've got a, a quick uh, taster for you now to see what uh, the uh, Yom Hatzmut celebrations that are going to be held at uh, Wembley Arena this year. Yeah, I couldn't think of a, a better way to actually celebrate uh, Israel's uh, 65th uh, birthday than uh, attending the Yom Hatzmut celebrations uh, at Wembley Arena on Tuesday, the 16th of April. Um, Keith, uh, for some of our viewers who would love to attend uh, this great gala fest uh, celebrating Israel, how, how can they actually get more information? Well, as your uh, program has been highlighting, most of the programs, so I believe, uh, <laughs> I haven't been looking at the screen, uh, if they go to the ZF website, it should take them, uh, direct them to uh, be able to book tickets to the gala event, which is at Wembley Arena. Uh, in fact, I, I'm looking forward to going. I think it's the only visit I'll be making to Wembley for a long time, as my football team hasn't been there for a while. So it will certainly be a, a great day. I think if you go to the ZF website, uh, it would direct you straight on to book tickets, I would have thought, online. Excellent. Uh, and Keith, I just want to show our appreciation for you being here on, on representing the Zionist Federation, that uh, representing the Jewish community, we're well, certainly representing the Christian community, um, that we're standing with you, that we're supporting with you. We know that there is a battle to communicate the truth regarding to Israel and that we're fully engaged in that battle to actually fight for the truth and really stand up against uh, anti-Semitism and really stand up for Israel. So thank you so much both for being my guests and Jeffrey, thank you so much for all your pioneering work in strengthening relationship between the Jewish and the Christian community. Thank you. And I uh, just want to thank you all for watching this program. And uh, I think we have to look back and think of the amazing 65 years in which uh, the modern state of Israel um, has existed, in, in which Israel has faced five major battles during that time. 
Uh, and yet Israel survived. Not only has she survived, but she's prospered and uh, the whole world is benefiting from her uh, remarkable and amazing achievements. So let's continue to stand with Israel. Uh, let's continue to stand with the Jewish people and uh, let's fight for truth and uh, enjoy this song that uh, looks at the amazing country that is Israel. She celebrates her 65th birthday.